I am so glad that you have put up with me for now three talks, and I will try not to make this one so long. Um, this talk is titled Continuance in Justification. And uh, in keeping with my whole theme for this whole time, what I've been trying to show is how jo Jack Miller kept together uh, in a simplicity and harmony that was rooted in the gospel, things that we don't naturally hold together. And one of those things is theology. And there's lots of discussion today about justification, its relationship to sanctification, union with Christ and adoption. And often those things get talked about in the abstract uh, and not in contact, uh, context of um, what Jack would call a new life and what I would like to show this morning or this afternoon from a new life. Uh, and let me just start by asking this question and I've titled, it's interesting, I've titled this Continuance in Justification. You might want to know why that title is uh, there as opposed to initial justification and final justification. And, uh, and it's really focusing on the nowness of the gospel and on justification today, um, not when you were originally converted and were justified for the once and for all for the first time, but how do you continue in that once for all justification? And to get at that, I'd like to kind of start by uh, asking a question like what, and the question is what is the number one reason that people do not share their faith. This was actually a study done on this. Uh, the number one reason that people do not share their faith, and I probably could say some of the similar reasons about why people don't pray, but what is the number one reason that you would say why you don't share your faith or why people don't share their faith? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they just said that. That, that what? Okay. okay. Are y'all hearing each other, some of the things that they're saying? She said, you don't believe in your heart that hell is real. Uh, Merle said, fear of rejection, which is what Rudy said. And Rudy said, afraid to, right? Fear of rejection. And what else did you say? Um, yeah, and then I heard someone say they don't know their faith very well. And then Mike said that, uh, say it again, Mike. Oh, right. Good understanding of the gospel. And uh, just kind of alluding to training a little bit. Uh, what else? Unbelief. Unbelief. Okay, yeah, good, yeah. You think it's reserved for evangelists? I mean, all these are reasons that people don't share their faith, but then they organized them. There was a study done on a Fuller Seminary, Fuller, Fuller Seminary, and Jack picked up on this, and it was really important for him that the number one reason of all those good reasons that you just described, the number one reason that people don't share their faith is because they don't think they're good enough. They don't think they're holy enough. Um, and, and that's another way of saying that they have a bad conscience. And um, this really gripped me when I uh, became a, a pastor, because often in the church, what happens is, um, well, let me use the illustration of a, uh, you've heard of the fish, a lamprey, and a lamprey is a parasitic, uh, it's a parasite, and it, it kind of hooks itself to the back of larger fish, of whales, of dolphins, of sharks, and I'm not a scientist, so I may not be getting this exactly right, but it kind of, hooks itself to this other uh, uh, fish and, and, and it feeds off of that fish and it just sucks the insides out. And so that fish will be a shark or a dolphin or whatever it is, will be going through the water and uh, kind of ignorant of the fact that they're dying until they're dead. And, um, and I think what happens often in the church is that we have a system set up to where, um, we uh, 
there's this kind of, the, the image I got was this lamprey of kind of this great sucking sound of righteousness that happens in the church. And so what you have is you have the, the preacher's is supposed, the preacher's supposed to be the most righteous person, right? He's the most holy person. He's supposed to teach, be teaching you how to be holy. And so often uh, a preacher may be, um, you know, you may think they're better than you. And, and, and if you're a missionary selling everything to go overseas, that's even a bigger deal. You're more righteous than even the preacher. And then, uh, and then there are those people who are in leadership, and they're not quite as righteous as the preacher, but they're more righteous than those people who are not leading. And then you got those people who don't, uh, they're in the pew of the church, and they come every week, they're regular attenders, but they don't necessarily, they're not as righteous as the leaders and the preacher, but they're better than the people who come once a month. And then you got the people who come once a month, and they're not as you know they're be- they're not as good as those people who come every week, but you've you've got uh, you're better than the people who come on Easter and Christmas, and then the people who come on Easter and Christmas, well they're not as good as the people who come once a month, but they're better, they're more righteous than the people who never come, who, who cut their grass or whatever on Sunday morning, and what you end up having in the church is you end up with a just this kind of righteousness sucking sound of uh, it's kind of and we compare ourselves to each other and what the gospel comes in and does is it exposes that you have no righteousness apart from Christ and and what a preacher really preaching is supposed to do is not elevating himself to present himself as more righteous than everybody else or needing to suck righteousness from his congregation what he is doing is drinking from the spring of living water so much that he's receiving so much of the righteousness of Christ that that righteousness is flowing from him as a spring of living water to other people. And he is a giver of righteousness because he is a receiver of such great righteousness. And it's very interesting to me that uh, Jack Miller developed the sonship program <laughs> in the context of a very important controversy that was going on in Westminster from 1974 to 1982 with a guy named Norman Shepard. And it really, it's actually inaccurate to say it was going on at Westminster because it actually originated in the OPC. And then uh, a professor here at Westminster, California, the first president, a guy named uh, Robert Strimpel actually uh, caught the person that was bringing charges in the presbytery and, and had him bring it into the seminary and they kind of walled it off behind the seminary spent all these years dealing with it in the seminary but then it bounced back to the presbytery because it was always a both and and over this whole question of justification and what it means and particularly what Shep, Norman Shepard had brought out is he wanted to he wanted to take the Westminster Confession view of justification which I'll, let me just read it to you here of, of what, it, what justification is. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accept us as right, accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. And uh, Shepard had a, a very viable concern that, and, and Jack Miller was really at the center of that along with D. James Kennedy because they were doing all this evangelism and people were coming to Christ. And it was this, in this, new, this booklet was part of it. People were coming to Christ from, in the middle of all these churches that didn't have a lot of people coming to Christ. And people were trying to wrap their minds around what's going on. And, and Shepard was really concerned that there was a lot of easy believism going on and that people weren't really committed to discipleship. And so he was trying to wrestle with a reformation. And it, it wasn't just in the OPC and Presbyterian circles, but you also had the Jesus movement going on. And you had all these people. You had all this... The, the stuff going on out in the West Coast and all the stuff going on the East Coast and <clears throat> all these conversions and and it was very shallow and people weren't uh, they weren't uh, continuing in their salvation and so Shepard was trying to he he began to re- think that the Reformation understanding of justification by faith alone that we get from John Calvin and Martin Luther that somehow that that kind of uh, needed to be reevaluated. And so he kind of began to talk about, using biblical theology to talk about initial justification is by faith. Everybody agreed on that. Initial justification is by faith alone. And then, but to continue in justification, you need to have works. And and he was, to his credit, he said, these are non-meritorious works. They're works by grace. And then at at the final judgment, you have 
You're justified, justified by faith plus works. And so Jack was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. And we, we, need, to, we need to talk about that. And, and Jack and Arthur Kushke, probably, I, th I think, more than the other opponents at the time of Shepard, uh, were probably the two central figures. There, was a lot of, there were a lot of other good leaders, but they weren't a member of both the OPC and Westminster faculty. And so this was a big deal that was going on. It really swallowed up the seminary. It caused people to leave. It caused people to question Westminster. In some ways, it's kind of how Westminster Seminary California came out here because a lot of that was going on and left a lot of bad taste in people's mouths. And Now, he, you could hear all that and you'd go, wow, man, why are we getting in this theological debate? And that's not why I'm bringing that up for you. What I want to bring that up for you is because often in all these debates over theology, we end up biting and devouring each other. And what I wanted to share with you is how God used that in Jack Miller's life, that he did not want to just be one of these people that criticized other people, but he wanted to listen to Shepard, he wanted to listen to Dick Gaffman, he wanted to listen to Palmer Robertson, Meredith Klein, these other people, and he is constantly processing these things in terms of the gospel, and he wanted to articulate a, a positive reason for why justification is by faith alone initially, continuing in the state of justification, and all the way to the end of the Christian life. And essentially, that it was through this contra controversy with Jack Miller getting away from it, and, and actually Shepard challenged him because Shepard got up in front of the whole faculty and the, and the presbytery and using a New Life booklet and said, Jack Miller, I want you, instead of y'all criticizing me, you need to tell me how this is different from what I'm teaching. And so Jack went away over Christmas break in 1978, and uh, he wrote a 40-page paper called Justification by Faith in the 20th Century. And he wrote another paper that went in front of the Presbytery of Philadelphia called Continuance in Justification. That's the, pres the Presbytery and the faculty called Continuance in justification to explain how he differed from his colleague whom he loved but disagreed with, Norman Shepard and Dick Gaffin, and they had been on the faculty for a long time, but he wanted, what he wanted to do was take Shepard's charge to him seriously and articulate a positive vision. Now, one of the things that I did in writing his biography is uh, I, I wrote the chapter in the dissertation. <laughs> my uh, my uh, supervising professor really wanted the um, biography not to be over, the dissertation not to be over 150 pages. Well, just the chapter on justification was 150 pages. <laughs> and so he uh, sent me back a note. It was really, I was really pleased because he, said, he laughed and said, this is a great, this is a great dissertation. <laughs> and it was only one chapter among six. And, but he let me keep going because he understood uh, that really sometimes the best way for people to understand theology and understand practice can come in, the, in a biography of reading that all together. And so he really let me uh, go through that. He let me keep working on that. But I remember when I first started talking to Paul Miller, who is Jack's son and who is the architect for what we know today as the Sonship Course, uh, for those of you that are familiar with that. And I said to, uh, and what, what I began to notice all the way through this, because Jack was this leader in this very important reform seminary, uh, that there were a lot of people that had slices of his life, but didn't have the whole. And that included his family. And so Jack was, uh, I said to Paul, when I first started doing this project, and I'd seen he had all this information in his archives on sharing the gospel. And he had all this information on prayer. And then the third area that he had all this information on was this controversy. And everything I had read about this controversy was really destructive. It was, there was no, I didn't hear one person that said there was anything good that came out of this controversy. It was painful. The people that I talked to didn't want to talk about it. 
they they had been they had lived it it was so hurtful for the whole community it was so hurtful for the whole opc it was so hurtful it kept uh it was largely responsible for keeping the opc and the pca from merging in 1982 83 time frame and and really in 87 when there was a chance for the opc to join again it was still kind of a shadow uh hanging over things and and if you really want to understand jack why i think someone mentioned why did they leave the opc Jack did not want to leave the OPC. Uh, he was the last of all the New Life folks that, um, that left. Uh, part of that was he got cancer, and he was, uh, when the other ones were leaving, after the OPC finally decided, I think it was 87, not to join, maybe 86, not to join with the PCA, uh, when the invitation was re-extended, then a lot of the people that were just waiting for that merger then left and went to the PCA, but even then, Jack did not want to leave because he had grown up in the OPC, and he had become a Christian in the OPC, and he loved the OPC, and he was, and I remember going through all the minutes of both Presbyteries at Philadelphia and the uh, in the OPC and the PCA, and he was so active as I went through all those records and went through all the minutes. He was so active in the OPC, but then when he gets to the PCA in '91, part of it he got sick and had a bunch of. Uh, uh, had been recovering from his cancer. Then in 93, he had a bunch of, started having um, what they call mini strokes and before he had a major stroke. But um, he really only went to two PCA presbytery meetings. And, uh, and so I think to really understand why Jack and them ended up leaving the OPC is he, Jack really wanted the OPC and the PCA to merge together. And they were, uh, he was working with the OPC and the PCA and PEF in Uganda and having to explain there's this great movement of the gospel going on in Uganda after Idi Amin. And all those people that are over in Uganda with the Presbyterian Church in Uganda are saying, how in the world can things be way worse over here and we can all be working together, but you over in the States, you can't, you're fighting over theology and can't work together. Which was, I think, a valid question. And Jack was really troubled by that. And so he really wanted the two to come together, and that's probably the best way to understand. And in a sense, he left the PCA because New Life left the PCA and voted to leave, but in a sense, he really never left. He never left you. Um, and, um, and so I think that was a, a real, big, uh, real big thing for him. But I remember asking Paul, and I told him, I said, Paul, I think Sonship and all of Jack's teaching on Galatians that he really started working through in, uh, in the shepherd controversy, all of that came out of those conversations that we, he was having uh, with uh, Professor Shepherd and, Do and Dr. Gaffin and Ed Clowney. And, and he was being sharpened and he began to see from Galatians that Galatians wasn't about justification by faith alone. The book of Galatians which really picks up in chapter 3. It gives you the background in chapter 1 and 2 and what was happening. The book of Galatians is about how you, how you maintain your spiritual freedom and power in the gospel on the foundation of justification. That's different. In other words, for Jack, it wasn't just about initially how you are justified and how Christ imputes his righteousness to you once and for all time. It, it, that justification wasn't something that you got at the beginning of the Christian life. It's what we talked about with evangelism and discipleship. It was something that continued as the way in the Christian life, as the foundation for you growing. By the same grace in which you were initially justified. And how that worked together in God's progressively sanctifying you on that foundation of the gospel. And it's, it's interesting what happened is people turned it into something more about sonship and adoption than what Jack was learning in that controversy and how justification and adoption is your chain standing with God and how that comes in and affects everything foundationally going forward. <coughs> And they wanted to think that, oh, Jack just recovered something about adoption. <laughs> but it was really a funny story that Paul told me. Paul was gathering. Paul uh, started working with the, uh, what they called the Uganda Committee because it was blowing up in, in Uganda. And they had all this, this 
kind of revivals going on over in Uganda and Jackson, the center of that, like he had been at the New Life churches and at Westminster. He was a huge influence on that seminary campus, just burgeoning, you know, from 1970 to 1980. And 50 to 20 percent of all the students were going to New Life at the time. And so all this stuff was happening. So Paul started gathering all the Jack's, basically Sonship was Jack's teachings on Galatians and how you maintain your spiritual and freedom and uh, spiritual freedom and power on the foundation of justification as you grow and you partner with the spirit in God changing you and transforming you uh, into his image and so uh, I think it was about the third lecture he had gathered Je his father's teachings in uh, Uganda and he was, te he was teaching the same class in his carriage house in Philadelphia and Paul was gathering this all together and, and uh, they had finished one of the talks and Jack was walking back toward his house and his son said, hey, we've got all this material. I'm putting it together in a course. What do you want to call it? And Jack had been reading um, Sinclair Ferguson's book, The Children of the Living God, and passing it out to everybody. And uh, he said, well, let's just call it Sonship. And so that really is how that got started was Jack wanted, he realized that the pew was full of people and they had been hearing all this stuff about go do evangelism, go pray, just like you're hearing today. And I've even heard some of you talk about, gosh, you hear about, I need to go share the gospel more, Christians and non-Christians, I need to go. And, and then this guilt and shame comes for what you're not doing, that you're not doing enough, right? And what Jack, what Jack understood was that the gospel, not only when it comes to the priestly work of Christ received by faith alone and the gospel from the initially continuing throughout your Christian life and all the way to the end of your Christian life, that when it comes to the gospel that is received by faith alone, that what ends up happening is it comprehends not only your unbelief, but also your guilt and shame. That God in the gospel takes all of your he takes all of your sin. He takes all of your guilt. He takes all of your shame. Christ is humiliated so you can be exalted. You can receive the righteousness of Christ. Now, <clears throat> I wanna, I'll talk a little bit about how that got abused. But what I wanted you to see, and actually when I talked to Dr. J. Adams before he died, and I was trying to get him to explain to me why he had originally been friends with Jack and later became so critical. And uh, I, this had to come from several different sources. It wasn't, uh, what happened was his, his um, successor, he had picked, handpicked a successor who was a son-in-law of Elizabeth Elliot. And, uh, and the church seemed to be doing pretty well. Uh, Professor, Dr. Adams was a really important leader at the time and so then his successor came in and uh, the church split he didn't know that his successor had been through sonship and uh, his his he was processing all that and he is he was one of those preachers like me who had left the gospel behind at the beginning of the Christian life and wasn't continuing with the gospel as the foundation for growing in the Christian life and so he was processing all that and when people have left the gospel behind when they hear the gospel afresh or maybe what I should say is when the gospel afresh catches them we always tend to whatever that is that helped us uh, learn we tend to turn into another idol and so he was kind of processing all that and it kind of split the church and it really upset uh, Dr. Adams and so he began Unfortunately for him, he began to look into this three years after Jack died, which he probably, had Jack still been alive, he would have called him and they would have talked it through. And uh, it would have been a far different matter but because Jack was dead. And I think because a lot of people in World Harvest and Sonship and had pieces of Jack's life, but they didn't have this piece of where he was coming up with this teaching on sonship and justification, continuing the Christian life. And then sonship got separated from Jack's vision for evangelism, and there was no one there who knew. Like, I interviewed all these people about the shepherd controversy in the different churches, and you know, the only person that said... Uh, um, Rick Downs said to me, who was one of the guys who 
uh, was a speaker on the early sonship tapes, he said to me, he said, I can't believe you're asking me about that. He said, I remember before Jack died, we were driving in the car somewhere to North Carolina and, uh, and I was driving and he was going with me and he started talking about this controversy and it was, uh, I think the controversy really officially ended in 1982, I think 83, but he, here he is in 1995 still talking to, uh, to Rick Downs about it. And he didn't, Jack didn't talk about what was happening in the seminary very much, except for maybe Ron Lutz and Dick Kaufman, a few of those folks. Uh, and so he says to Rick Downs, he says, I, he's just heartbroken because he thought that the controversy was never settled and the way that it was settled was poorly done. And so it still bothered him that he thought a lot of the things that we later faced in our different denominations on federal visions and new perspectives in Paul kind of first surfaced in this other controversy that happened in uh, 1974 to 1992. But my point is, is that uh, because people only had a part of Jack's life, they couldn't understand the fullness of where he was coming with sonship in the context of all the other things that he taught as a whole, which is one of my burdens in writing the biography. But I did ask Dr. Athens, I said, would it have made it, does it make a difference to know to you if I can track every lecture in sonship and I can show you where it comes out of Jack's writings in his discussions with Shepard and Gaffin? And he said, yeah, that's probably true. But he took just the 1990, I think it was the 1995 manual, which was just a collection of lectures that Paul thought was Jack's best lectures, and pulled those together. He didn't understand why Jack was using his personal experience so much. He thought he over-focused on experience, and he confused other things. But when you just look at that separated, I think, Dr. Adams had a good point, but when you look at the whole and see what Jack intended with all of what he was doing, I think that would have answered, and, and I certainly have tried to answer, answer many of the criticisms. But what I'd like to do is just kind of just surface, skim through um, this paper that Jack wrote uh, and just kind of go over some things. It won't take very long if I can find them. Um, these nine affirmations that he made about justification, so you can see how he saw that as continuing in the Christian life. And the first thing, uh, Jack had studied um, Dutch, he had studied with the application of Dutch Calvinism uh, to the, applied to the um, practice, to literature. And so he had a particular approach to how he was going to use Van Til and Duiverd to get at the presuppositions and use the language of other people. So he wanted to use Shepard's language, he wanted to use Gaffin's language to say what he wanted to say more constructively. And so he uh, listed nine affirmations in this essay that he wanted to start with. Instead of just being critical of other people, he wanted to say, this is why I believe what I believe. And the first thing he said is, I wish to affirm that it is my conviction that justification by faith has as a foundational presupposition a consciousness of the majesty of God and the absolute demands of his justice. I was talking to somebody here and we were talking about how people minimize sin. They minimize the holiness of God. And so Jack wanted us to see that the basis, the basic presupposition is when you have a small view of God's holiness, then justification isn't going to mean a whole lot to you. If you don't take his law seriously, what's the big deal about justification? And the absolute demands of his justice. There's a lot of talk in our denominations today about justice, and a lot of times we separate justice from grace, but here's the thing, grace is about justice. The gospel is about justice. You take away justice, what's the point of the gospel? Take away God's law, and so second on that, Jack wanted to affirm that the cure for our disease lies 
in a personal encounter with God's law. Not an abstract encounter, a personal encounter with God's law and the conviction of sin which arises from that encounter. We were talking at one of our tables about um, people don't like to talk about sin today. And I was making the point, the difference between sin and the revelation of sin. People don't want to talk about the revelation of sin today unless we want to reveal somebody else's sin. We don't want to talk about the revelation of our sin. But the revelation of sin, if you're dying of cancer and the doctor doesn't reveal to you that you're dying of cancer, is that a good thing? That's stupidity, right? And so the revelation of God of how self-reliant you are, the thing that you don't want to hear, that you find a disadvantage, is good news for you. And Jack used to say, if the original, if original sin is true, then the grace is true. The best news you ever heard is that you're a sinner. Let me say that again. The best news you ever heard is that you're a sinner because if the sin is true, the grace is true. And you wouldn't know it if God didn't reveal it to you. You'd be dead to your sin. You'd be dead to your self-centeredness. And thirdly, Jack wanted to affirm his conviction that the Scriptures clearly teach that before new birth and saving faith, all men are in a state of condemnation. And what he's really getting at here is a lot of people in our circles confuse the doctrine of election with the doctrine with justification by faith. And so we say, oh gosh, we're elected before the foundation of the world. Our salvation, once for all, justification is sealed in heaven. But you don't receive that until by faith you take what, belong, what Christ has done for you and receive it in your own experience. And a lot of us have conflated those things. And so the gospel's not sweet to us. Jesus has already paid for it. It's not anything created, but we don't want to go to him and have him reveal that to us so that we can actually receive the treatment that he already comprehended to cover. Which brought him to a fourth point. In that context, I wish to affirm the fundamental distinction between a legal promise and a gospel promise. And for this, he... Uh, used Calvin's treatment in justification in the Institutes of Christian Religion. Um, and this legal promise and gospel, I'm saying it this way because my guess is all of you have heard teaching on the law and the gospel. And you've heard teaching on justification. You've heard teaching on sanctification. And what you keep hearing me do is I don't want to just teach you about it. I don't want you to just hear education like education is going to save you. Education is important. But it's got, you've got to have a personal encounter with the living Christ where he is actually by his spirit applying this truth to your heart. And so I'm using this language not just of law and gospel. I like this because it's per, it, when you say it's a legal promise and a gospel promise, now we're talking about something that you learned earlier includes prayer. And the reason it, it's something very personal, it's something that's happening not just sealed in heaven, which it is once for all time, but it's actually something you take and it's becoming an ex existential part of your life through prayer. The finished work of Christ applied to your particular sin particularly. As you in continue in justification, so what we hear people say today is justification means God's no longer angry at me. Well, I think that's a little bit simplistic because when you see, I think we should know that God in propitiation, he takes away his anger and places it on his son. But when you're living in sin and you're not confessing that, that really irritates God. Especially when you know that he takes away your guilt and shame. He takes away. Now, he doesn't get angry like we get angry. But God hates sin. Right? And so he justifies you and he places all of his anger on Jesus. And now, even though that is all of yours, if you're holding on to your sin and you're not giving it to him, then you're not experiencing afresh how he took away all his anger and how he takes away your guilt and shame in Jesus' humiliation and gives it to you in the power of his resurrection. And so you're never, you're never changed and the gospel's not sweet. It's just something we take for granted. And what happens in the legal promise and the gospel promise is the legal, what's so interesting in both of those, and you see how this gets to a new life, 
Both of those include a promise of life. The legal promise is a promise of life, it, not just an abstract theological discussion, it's a promise of life that's based upon the conditionality of you keeping the law. Leviticus 18 says, it says about us, it, it, it gives us this promise that if you do this, you live. If you keep God's law, you live. And if you don't, the implication is you die. That's the legal promise. And we try to live by the legal promise and get this promise of life. And when we fail, guess what? We die. And so what we have to do, if we, we're not on the foundation of justification, then we have to compare ourselves to other people and say, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Or I'm better than these people who only come for Easter's and, Easter and Christmas to church. And we start sucking righteousness from each other. Why? Because we've turned away from the spring of living water as our righteousness. And so if you live under the gospel promise, what happens is fundamentally, God, Jesus comes in and once and for all time answers the condition of the legal promise. He fulfills all the condition of the legal promise and becomes the gospel promise to you so that in Him you have all of His righteousness. He quietens the law. The picture is the mercy seat, right? It's got the Ten Commandments in the, in the, in the Ark of the Covenant. You've got the Ten Commandments, the manna, and, and the staff of Moses. It's, it's there in the... Uh, mercy seat and you get this picture of Indiana Jones right when the mercy seat is taken off and he just everybody's fried you know in, in Indiana Jones you know when we look at the law apart from Christ when we try to call, when we try to make other people look at their sin apart from the mercy seat that's actually cruel that's mean we look at that through the mercy seat where the mercy seat comes in and covers the gospel promise covers all of our sin so that it's covered and we're covered in Christ. The gospel promise is unconditional. Not only at the beginning of the Christian life, but by faith throughout the Christian life. And so the fifth affirmation that Jack wanted to make is that the gospel promise is always Initially, throughout the state of your Christian life, and at the final judgment, is always and only by faith alone. So whereas his colleague, Shepherd, was arguing that the gospel and evangelism, if you focused on justification by faith alone, it would undermine discipleship, Jack said the exact opposite. That only when you see the gospel for non-Christians and Christians, and that justification is always by faith alone, right? That only in that context can you make discipleship a reality. And to get at this, he said he wanted to really highlight, remember what we talked about when you preach the gospel and how we, faith is created in us in the hearing of the gospel, right? If you, try to add, if you try to add the works and try to become a van, better evangelist without preaching the gospel to yourself, you're just going to turn evangelism into a new work. When you try to pray without your own need of the gospel and you coming afresh by faith alone and confessing how you haven't prayed, all you're doing is going to become self-righteous about your prayer ministry. Because it's justification, the only way you can ever be justi justified before God is by faith alone. Because for Jack, faith alone equaled Christ alone. Faith is what humbles you out of your self-reliance so that you never look to anything, anyone or anything else for righteousness, only to Christ throughout your Christian life and even at the final judgment that if you try to present your good works to God as a justification for your final vindication, you're condemned. And what happens in the church is because we are not preaching the gospel to one another and praying with one another and asking the Holy Spirit to apply this once-for-all justification 
all time in the present value of the gospel. You have all of us in this pews collecting our sins and feeling guilty and feeling ashamed and we never do enough. And the people become immobilized. And I'm really challenging you leaders that you cannot immobilize your people in the pews by burning their conscience and telling them to do all this stuff without you leading them to the spring of living water to receive grace afresh, to free them, to get their honeys out of the pew and to go with the gospel as someone who's being changed by the gospel yourself. And then look what that does. That missionalizes your progressive sanctification. Because now... You want to change because Jesus has done it all and you don't want to fool the people that you're talking to about you being better than you really are. You're helping them to take the sinner's place. It really completely refocuses the trajectory of your sanctification to the glory of Christ. Just like justification is about the glory of Christ. And that faith has a unique role that any time you add any kind of works to faith, I don't even care if you call them non-meritorious works. Your human works, when you try to add it to the priestly work of Christ, will always eat up faith and make the gospel of no value to you. I think that's what Galatians 1 is about. It was just circumcision. It wasn't a big deal. And yet it was a doorway into a whole way of life, of living in relationship with the God and his rules, that your works trying to add to the perfect work of Christ would just only screw up the beautiful, perfect work of Christ and rob you of the basis and foundation for your freedom and joy in Christ given to you by the Spirit as you continue to come to Him in faith with your sin and receive afresh this once and for all time work that He has always meant for you to enjoy. And in this sense, faith is, must be seen as prior to justification and the application of redemption. So Jack was very, it was very important to him that you not confuse justification with election so that there, for him there was no such thing as eternal justification. You weren't justified until you received the finished work of Christ by faith. He says, therefore I'm persuaded that this is a matter of importance just because it protects the humble character of justifying faith. And so we conclude then that God from all eternity decreed to justify his elect and Christ died for their sins on the cross and rose again for their justification but it is still true that they are not justified until they have first believed in Jesus and his righteousness has been imputed to them by faith. And you see the connection between justification and evangelism and the faith building character of the, of the gospel. And if you look in your booklet here on page on this page with fact three, look what it has. Self-centered man is separated from a holy God by three big barriers: a bad record, a bad master, a bad heart. Remember, we said the gospel changes your standing with God and changes your inward being. What is a bad record? Jesus takes your record and puts, uh, God takes your record and puts it on Jesus. And he takes Jesus' record and imputes it to your account. That's on the next page of how God addresses it. God takes your bad heart and gives you, when he says he gives you a new heart, whose new heart is that? Is this just an abstract new heart that you can screw up again? No, he gives you Jesus' heart. He takes this bad master. Slave is a sin is a sin is a, an enslaving power. Self-reliance is an enslaving power. He takes away your bad master in the gospel and gives you a new master as Jesus is your Lord. And so this whole booklet is tied in. He wants people to continue not just to start their Christian life in justification by faith alone, but he wants to explain how you continue the Christian life in justification by faith alone and are built up in the gospel. I think the one person that really helped me this was William Lane. 
with uh, Hebrews chapter 6 where we talk about leaving the elementary principles and growing up into maturity, right? And in our mind, what we do is we naturally interpret that leaving, and I think this is kind of how addicted to our works we are, we naturally inter interpret that leaving as leaving behind the elementary principles of repentance and faith and then growing into maturity as if, uh, as if moving on to something else. But really, uh, Dr. Lane said that leaving it could be leaving behind, but it also could mean leave standing, leave in place. And if you've ever been around a development or a place where there's been a foundation laid and, uh, and the house hasn't been built right, and you wonder, what in the world? There's a foundation and there's no house. And really what Hebrews 6 is about is leave standing the foundation of repentance and faith, those elementary principles, and build up on that foundation. <laughs> Not leave it behind and quit repenting and quit believing, but leave it standing and grow up. Now, a lot of people later, because they had been cut off from justification in the Christian life and continuance in justification, and they'd been collecting all these sins, and all of a sudden they hear justification, at least this happened with me for the first time in a long, long time, if not ever, and you go, oh my gosh, wow. And then you start confusing, and you start to think that justification by faith that sanctification is actually just growing up in your justification, which is not true. Justification is the foundation on which you're to build. So before you became a Christian, you were dead to your self-centeredness. Now you've been made alive to Christ so that you might be crucified with Christ and the life you no longer live, you live, uh, you, you live by faith now in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. And you build up on that foundation own that finished work of Christ and you continue in the grace that he originally gave you and that he continues to give you. And so Jack wanted to affirm the vital power of saving faith as his sixth point. That God's act justifying the ungodly and he continues to call us to faith. And so when you go out and share the gospel with other, other people and you share the gospel with each other, it's that message that continues to capture your heart as a preached message. And seventh, he wanted to affirm that it's my belief that Galatians and related passions, passages in the New Testament draw a sharp distinction between the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant. I, I don't have time to develop that. That was a big deal at the time. The eighth thing he said is, I affirm my conviction that declarative justification is set forth in Romans 3 and 4 and Galatians 2 and 3 is a definitive once for all time act of God's grace on behalf of the ungodly. And his ninth affirmation is, I affirm that declarative justification properly understood does not cancel out discipleship, but makes discipleship a reality. And Jack, he then, in continuance and justification, really zeroed in on John Owen and John Calvin and Gerhardus Voss to drive his point home. But I'm just going to read, in closing, one quote by Gerhardus Voss on this. Voss said this, but we dare not dismiss the point, that is the relationship of justification and sanctification. Um, we, we dare not dismiss this um, and there's a lot of false, you know, can be pretty <laughs> um, abstract sometimes. He said, we dare not dismiss this as if they're equal because it would create a, uh, yield a dualism too hard to put up with. So he's talking about justification and sanctification. You can't say, let me see if I can interpret it. You can't say there's a, the railroad track and one rail is justification and another rail is sanctification and the train has to keep on that track can't say that. That's not how this works. It's not how salvation works. And you can't say that, oh, you got this pie chart of union with Christ, and so you got justification and adoption and sanctification, and you get this neat pie chart. It doesn't work that, that way. Justification is foundational to sanctification, is his point. And he said, as soon as the question is raised with this dualism between justification and you're trying, people say, well, we've got to preach the whole counsel of God, which means we've got to preach half justification and half saying, no. As soon as the question is raised about this dualism, 
through its principal superiority of the solution can hardly be other than the forensic principle of justification is supreme and keeps in subordination to itself the transforming principle of sanctification. Justification and sanctification are not the same. And an endless amount of harm has been done by the short-sighted attempt to identify them as such. But neither are these two independent, one of the other, and this is what I want to get at, the one fix sets the goal and fixes, fixes the direction, and the other follows. And here's his point. Preachers, you got to be preaching the gospel to your people because the gospel fixes the goal. Justification by faith alone fixes the goal of union with Christ. That you have been united with Christ by faith and it always humbles you back into Christ alone as your righteousness. It fixes the goal and it sets the direction for the righteousness of Christ as you follow Him and then sanctification grows out of that and continues forward, continues building upon that justifying work to the finished work of Christ. And so justification, if you're finding yourself trying to do a balancing act between justification and sanctification, it's not going to be any wonder that people who are addicted to their self-reliance sitting in the pews are always going to be struggling with guilt and shame and collecting their failures because you're not giving them the fixed goal and direction to where God is taking them. To look like Christ, which He has already promised to do. The way we are sanctified is by the power of the Holy Spirit sanctified through faith in partnership with the Holy Spirit as we get on board with His agenda. And a lot of times, our sanctification approaches, apart from the gospel, are just selective attempts to change ourselves in ways that we see are the most important. And often, the Holy Spirit and Jesus want to change us in altogether different ways than we're even thinking about. And so what we end up doing is actually fighting with the Holy Spirit about where He's taking us and how He's getting us there. And we're refusing to be humbled and we're really just sanctifying our self-reliance. And so what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to get at here is not just that you begin the Christian life with the gospel and then go on to discipleship and end up trying to change yourself that you not only begin the Christian life with justification by faith alone and then start working on your discipleship and sanctification, but everything happens on that foundation of justification in our practical union with Christ, who is then building us up and changing us to look like and to make us righteous in the way he's declared us to be righteous. And so let me just tie this all the way back to the simple issue of sanctification, I mean of justification by faith. And I think this is why Jesus says in John that I have been consecrated, or use the same word as sanctified, I've been sanctified so that you may be sanctified, right? And he, and he then it, and it immediately sends them. It's a, it's a sanct, even, your, even your progressive sanctification is about sharing the gospel. And it's one thing for me to teach you all of this that we're talking about, try to teach you, poorly as I seem to feel like I'm doing this afternoon when everybody's tired. It's one thing for me to try to, to educate you in this. It's, it's quite another thing for you to experience afresh the, the, the power and the freedom of the justifying work of God in Christ applied to you by the Spirit as you go with the gospel to other people and you're sharing about what Christ has done and you hear the Holy Spirit teaching you the same thing. That he's actually applying the reality of justification by faith alone as you go with the gospel. And if you don't go with the gospel, guess what? You're not hearing it yourself. The way this worked out for me 
This will be the end here, I think. What time were we supposed to be through? Huh? 1.50? Okay, let's stop. Well, there's no last point. I was just going to say the way this worked out with me and my own personal life is I, um, it, God's just really funny. <laughs> God's really, he has a great sense of humor to have to sanctify me. And, uh, because I just don't get it. And so we were, I had to go through, I went through sonship at the same time that I was a leader in our church, a Baptist church of all things, of all things, and Baptists love their works. You know, they love evangelism for non-Christians, they love their works. And, um, and I was uh, the leader of Evangelism Explosion, which was D. James Kennedy of PCA ministry. And uh, I was one of two leaders. And, uh, and then I was also teaching a Sunday school class at the time. And the Sunday school class was larger than our churches in Baptist circles than PC, most PCA churches. And the topic they give you from Lifeway at the time was on the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so I'm teaching on the Ten Commandments. I'm doing evangelism explosion training. And I'm going through sonship. <laughs> and and um, it was so interesting because... I was, uh, I would go to, um, I would go on Sunday morning, I wake up Sunday morning, and I, I owned my own business and had people working for me, and uh, so I was tired during the week, and I would get up on Sunday morning, had, had kids, so kids can make you tired, and then I'd get up on Sunday morning, and I have to work on my Sunday school lesson, Ten Commandments, huh. often on the legal promise, because I didn't know much about the gospel promise. And I would teach, and then, you know, we still, a lot of churches today only have one service a day, and sometimes they might have small groups, but we had two services, and I was also a deacon at the time, by the way, and uh, we would, so we, I would go to church and uh, teach, and then uh, we'd have evening service, and um, by the time I got through Sunday night, I was just exhausted, just completely miserable. And, you know, if, it, it, it kind of uh, plagued me that the Sunday is to be a day of rest. And I, the one thing that didn't happen for me on Sunday was rest. And I realized I had a lot of screwed up ideas of some of that stuff. But then our EE was on, was on Monday night. And EE is a four-hour endeavor. So you go in and you meet with your, um, you meet with your uh, person you're training you go over the gospel with each other and then you get together and pray and then you go out and then you come back. And what I began to notice, uh, being the anal researcher that I am, uh, I began to notice that the most precious day of the week for me was Monday night, not Sunday. And as I was going with EE um, and and training it didn't matter well it's so interesting if there was a if we got rained out and we just went and just practiced sharing the gospel with our trainee it was still a blessing if we went and someone didn't want to talk to us it was a blessing if we uh, went and someone got converted it was a blessing and so I was going I was doing that and I, I began to ask how is it and I began to ask my wife Vicki who was also involved there's probably 50 people involved in evangelism training and I asked her I said honey how is this happening why am I so miserable Sunday and then Monday I have there's this this it's, it's a complete change as we go with the gospel and get back and worship is not something that I'm I mean it just happens I mean you just everybody's worshiping and so I actually began so I asked Vicki and she said you know she was she was going through sonship with me so she was more helpful than most but i asked the other people in the group if they would notice the same thing was happening in their own life and they did they they were like gosh you know this is this is life-giving to us too and so i said why do you think that's the case why do you think that uh, our coming and doing you know every person said well that's because we're being obedient and if other people were obedient too then they could have this blessing and I was listening to that. Now, normally I would have said, yeah, great. Yeah, I'm being obedient. I, I'm you know, kind of better than you. But I was going through sonship and praying for God to show me my sin. <laughs> and God 
just wouldn't let me do that because I've just been a liar. Because I, I mean, here I was. I was actually on what would happen is on Sunday, I was so tired on Monday morning, I would actually literally start wishing that my trainee would call and cancel. <laughs> wishing is like prayer, right? Essentially, when you wish, I'm just praying to somebody or something, saying, you know, or I was wishing that, you know, maybe it would get so stormy that we cancel. And yet it didn't matter as I, so I knew that it wasn't true that I was being obedient because obedient isn't just doing your duty. Obedient is doing your duty with a loving heart and with joy. And I had no joy until after, right? And so I, and I said that to them and they, uh, I said that to the other folks. I said, I, I think something else is happening. I don't think God's blessing us because we're being faithful, at least for me, that I'm being faithful I think what God is doing is blessing us despite my unfaithfulness. And what he intends to do is minister the gospel to me as I'm sharing it with other people, that I am as much a target for the gospel as the people I'm sharing the gospel with are targets of his gospel, that the Holy Spirit is working on all of us. And that was the first time I began to realize in a very practical way that the gospel is for Christians. That, if I had to summarize any one thing about Jack's life and ministry in this harmony of the gospel that just sticks with me above everything else is that he took a gospel that we in the church had cut ourselves off from as something only for conversion and he brought back that Christians need the gospel as much as non-Christians. Just the simplicity of that had to break my heart. And then I understood where all the joy was coming from. Father, I pray that you would, uh, for these things that we're talking about today, that justification wouldn't just be an abstraction. Would you preach justification to our hearts? Uh, I pray for each person here that's kind of holding on to guilt and shame. Maybe they're hearing about evangelism and they're hearing about um, prayer and they're just confronted with, uh, they're having an encounter with you with their self-reliance and the, and the most natural thing for us to do is to promise to do better. To promise to not keep on doing what we've been doing. Which is not necessarily a bad thing, but we never soak, we never come back to the foundation and hear you declare to us that we have been justified and that justification is ours by faith alone, in Christ alone, who alone is our righteousness. And we have nothing in ourselves to give, no promises to do better. Would you preach that message? Would you take not only the sin of prayerlessness and the fact that we don't want to really share our faith with other people and we learn to share it with each other and our fears, our fears of rejection, our desires for human approval, w would you take all of that and would you give us Christ's own heart for how he loves to share the gospel, his own spirit, for how he's, gosh, he is ripening the harvest, how much he wants to preach the gospel to us and divine appointments that he already has in mind for us. That we don't have to work up and create Pentecost, that Pentecost creates us. And would you specifically take away guilt and shame and bring us under your delight? Thank you that you've placed all of your anger on Jesus, that he is our propitiation, he is our expiation uh, and that to take Christ is to be his and to be justified by him not based upon our works in any way so would you make this preaching the gospel a reality for us to just pull out at the roots our own self-reliance and give us confidence that you've given us the spirit that we can partner with Christ as you continue to change us and you continue to humble us so that we can grow and look like Christ, so that other people can see what Christ has done 
and want to know how to deal with their own self-reliance. I pray for each person here today that the present gospel, the present value of the gospel would be real, the nowness of the gospel would be real and present. In Jesus' name, amen.